We have covered a lot of ground in our quest to understand Torah and how things got from Moshe, from Moses, to us. We talked about the concept of rabbinic law, the jurisdiction of the rabbis, the precedent of instituting new edicts, new ordinances, new laws. We talked about the idea of fences around the Torah. We talked about the idea of rabbinic mitzvahs, even though there are only seven completely new rabbinic mitzvahs. We talked about how a rabbinic law could be rescinded. And there's three different ways that it could be undone. Either if it was done temporarily. And the example that we have in the Talmud for that is when the prophet Nehemia, he made a ban against moving things on Shabbos, moving almost anything on Shabbos. But he did it temporarily just to reverse the trend. And once things stabilized, he annulled or he rescinded that particular temporary decree. Another way that a rabbinic decree can be undone if it is undone by a greater court, and I don't believe there's any precedent for that. There may be, but I'm not aware of it. And finally, a third way that a rabbinic edict can be undone would be if it was never adhered to by the nation. If the nation never accepted it, like the example, the ban against Gentile oil, then it does not have validity. We also talked about the perpetuation of the Torah, the written Torah, the oral Torah, the various safety measures to ensure the accurate transmission of the Torah. And of course, over the years and over the centuries, we discussed the various edicts and ordinances and decrees of the various courts and the sages throughout the generations. And in essence, what we have over here is a system that's designed to withstand the vicissitudes of history. It's designed to be foolproof. It's designed to overcome human fallibility, to overcome the ups and downs, the upheavals of the centuries. The oral Torah is a system that's both dynamic yet stable. It's dynamic because there's new edicts and new laws that are added to, to ensure that the Torah is being maintained over the centuries. But the interpretation of the written Torah, that part of oral Torah, to understand the meaning behind the written Torah, that remains the same. And we're keeping the Torah from Moses, adding to it when the Sanhedrin sees fit, and the system's working. Now, it's important to stress that there is a prohibition. In fact, it's mentioned three times in the Torah. There is a prohibition against adding or subtracting from the Torah. You cannot make a new mitzvah. Uh, yet apparently, it seems like these rabbis are coming up and making all kinds of new mitzvahs on their own. If you cannot alter the Torah, on what grounds can the rabbis make decrees and ordinances? How does rabbinic law coexist with the prohibition of adding and deducting, subtracting from the Torah. So this question is addressed by the Ramban in the book of Deuteronomy, Devarim chapter 4. That's the first of three times where it talks about not to add nor subtract from the Torah. And he tells us two points. He says, number one, this in itself is a Torah mitzvah. The Torah tells us, tells the Sanhedrin, that you must add new edicts and ordinances when it is necessary. However, there is a condition that you may not institute a new mitzvah or a new ordinance or a new decree and present it and portray it as if it is part of what God gave Moshe. You have to clearly differentiate. You have to clearly delineate between Torahitic law and rabbinic law. And in fact, in Jewish law, we know that there are practical differences between rabbinic law and Torahitic law. For example, in a case where there is an uncertainty, there is doubt. The general rule of thumb is that if it is rabbinic law, you opt to be more lenient. And if it is Torahitic law, then you opt to be more stringent. So we have this foolproof system that is designed to withstand everything that happens in our history. And we also have an institution that's there to remedy any mistakes, any disputes that may arise. And that, of course, is a Sanhedrin. And we're told in the Talmud of the Book of Sanhedrin, page 88b, that initially there were no disputes among the Jewish people. 
there was the court comprised of 71 sages, and they would sit in the marble chamber. That's a certain part of the temple. And there were two smaller courts comprised of 23 justices apiece. One of them was stationed at the entrance of the Temple Mount, and one was stationed at the entrance of the Temple Court. And throughout the land, there's an entire network of smaller courts that are more regional. And whenever there's a question, whenever there's an uncertainty, whenever there's a dispute, you go to your local rabbi, you go to your local based in to your local Sanhedrin, to the small Sanhedrin that is in charge of your city or your region. And you pose the question. And if that is part of the resolved corpus of oral Torah, they give you the answer, and the uncertainty is remedied. And if not, you take the case up to the higher court. You go to the court that is situated at the entrance of Temple Mount. And if they know the answer, they're, after all, they're a more national court, and they have greater sages. So maybe they know the answer. And if they know the answer, great, the question is resolved. But if not, well, then you push it up to the even higher court at the entrance of the temple courtyard. And once again, the question is presented in front of them. And if they know the answer, great. If not, it goes to the highest court of the land, it goes to the Sanhedrin, and they would sit in session from the morning till the afternoon, from the morning tamid sacrifice till the afternoon tamid sacrifice. And even on Shabbos and festivals, they would sit and they would address any Torah questions that came before them. And you know what? If this is not even known to them, then they have to take a vote. And they stand up to be counted. And we follow the majority. So if you have 36 on one side, that is the new standard. That is the new precedent. Uh, stare decisis, as they say in America, we have a new precedent, a new law that has been codified, canonized by the Sanhedrin, and that is going to be disseminated throughout the land. We have a resolution. The question has been quieted. And this Sanhedrin, they're the guardians of the Oral Torah. And we are biblically commanded to listen to them. In fact, the Raman points out that there are two separate mitzvos requiring us to adhere to the ruling of the Sanhedrin. So we have an entire system. It's a great system where Torah is being perpetuated. We have the Sanhedrin. We're not having disputes. Any dispute is quickly snuffed out. Things are great. But at some point, this foolproof system, the system that was in place since the times of Moses, this system is discarded and is going to be replaced with a new system. The Oral Torah is going to be progressively written down and codified. First we have the Mishnah, then the Talmud, and then the Halacha, and there is an entire departure from the system that we got from Moshe. What happened that made us discard such an ingenious and foolproof system? That's the question we're going to try to answer today. And to do that, we're going to need to study the Second Temple period and the century that followed its destruction. And what we're going to discover is that over these five centuries, the nation underwent seismic, disruptive changes that rendered the old system untenable and necessitated a major change in how Torah was studied and perpetuated. So let's begin where we are. The nation is scattered. We have the Babylonians coming. They're conquering the land. They take the majority of Jews to Babylon. But in Babylon, the nation quickly adapts and they build a wonderful community in Babylon that lasted for millennia. In fact, until the 20th century, there was a very strong community in Babylon, what's today called Iraq. After 70 years of exile, the Jews are invited to go back to Israel. But the vast majority of Jews on the eastern lands in Babylon, they decide to stay there. 
they have gotten cozy in their new home and they don't want to go back to Israel. So we have a brand new development. From this point forward, the nation is going to be splintered. There's going to be a large contingency of Jews in Babylon, and there's going to be Jews in Israel. Of course, you also have the ten lost tribes that departed for parts unknown. But this new development is going to pose a major challenge to the continuity of oral Torah. Jews are scattered. Jews are ununified. Jews are thousands of miles away away from each other. How are you going to maintain the system where communication is going to be very difficult and impossible from one Jewish center to another Jewish center? In fact, the Talmud even talks about how they had to resort to very creative ways to convey the new month, the fact that the based in the court, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, declared a new month. How do you convey that a thousand miles to the Jews on the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River in Mesopotamia and Babylon? How are you going to do that? They would actually have to take torches and go onto mountaintops and pass this message over the desert from juncture to juncture, from place to place. That's, of course, a very difficult challenge. But this is only the beginning. There's another challenge that's going to really develop in the Second Temple Era, and that is that the Jews are going to be subject to a new kind of hostile foreign rule. The nation, of course, had long been forced to contend with foreign rule, but not all foreign rule is the same certainly vis-a-vis the spiritual well-being of the people. You have the Canaanites, you have the Assyrians, you have the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, all these nations are ruling our people, often with a harsh iron fist, and of course, maintaining equilibrium, perpetuating Torah under foreign rule is always a great challenge. But during the Second Temple Era, the empires that are controlling the Jews in the Second Commonwealth, namely the Greeks and the Romans, they're going to add another component that's going to, again, make it very difficult for all Torah to be perpetuated. Not only are these empires going to be brutal and hostile physically, they're going to tread on the nation spiritually as well. The Greeks, of course, were quite famous for preaching their spiritual and cultural mores upon their conquered people. Their conquest was not just about land and taxation. It was about cultural diffusion, the idea of Hellenism, the idea of taking Greek philosophy and disseminating it amongst other conquered people. That's going to add another challenge. Moreover, in the Second Temple period, like we mentioned in the past, we're going to have the loss of prophecy. So we no longer have a prophet that is universally respected and revered who is going to be like a unifying force amongst the people. So we're going to have Jews that are going to slip through the cracks and be seducted to go join the Greeks, and that's the idea of the Hellenized Jews. Jews who wanted to abandon what it means to be Jewish, at least traditionally, and now let's reinvent the Jew, let's make a Greek Jew. So we have the Hellenists and their spiritual descendants, the Sadducees. And this pattern continued, of course, under the Romans as well. Moreover, this new foreign ruler they are going to be alluring to the nation. They're sophisticated. They're intellectual. They're thinkers. And that's a different kind of enemy, an enemy that we kind of could relate to on a certain level. You think about the the Cossacks or the deeply anti-Semitic Poles. If you have a Polish peasant that's drunk and toothless, and all he wants to do is beat up the Jews, it's not very appealing. You don't want to be his friend. 
But when you have an advanced society, the emancipated Europeans, the French Revolution, liberty, brotherhood, we love you. Come join our university. We'll think together. Come partake in our culture. That is a different kind of enemy because that is an enemy that's drawing us near and sadly causing us to lose what makes us special. Jacob, when he was going to reunite with his brother, he prayed to God, save me from my brother, save me from Asaph. He recognized that there were two threats. There's Asaph the murderer, and there's Asaph the brother who loves me. Our relationship with our Gentile overlords also have these two threats. There's Asaph, there's the physical hostility, and then there's the brother. In the Second Temple era, more Jews began to be drawn to the brotherness of the foreign rule. Another challenge within the Jewish people, and this is, of course, adjacent to the previous idea, the Jewish people are going to have various, even warring sects amongst them. And this is going to cause a major disruption to the system the rise of sectarianism and factionalism. The great Jewish slash Roman historian Josephus, he speaks of sects. There's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes. We also know of a tiny group of Jews, the Judeo-Christian sect that arose in the Second Temple era. By the Talmudic calculation, at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple in the first century of the Common Era, the nation was comprised of 24 different, often warring, sects. And these factors are going to intensify over time. And it's going to cause the nation to face a stark choice. You either are going to adapt the system of Oral Torah, you're either going to reinvent Oral Torah, or you're going to face the prospect of losing it. And as we go through this time period, we're going to see all these factors are going to contribute to this transformational shift in Torah. So the Second Temple era began with the leadership of the men of the Great Assembly. The last member of the men of the Great Assembly a great legend and hero. His name was Shimon Hatzadik, Shimon the Righteous. He was actually the high priest of the Jewish people. And he is the leader of the Jewish people during the conquest of Alexander. Alexander of Macedonia, the Greeks are coming, and they're taking over the world. And in fact, the Talmud even records that Shimon Hatzadik, the leader of the Jewish people, the remnant of the men of the Great Assembly, he has a meeting with Alexander. The Greeks are going to do a lot of damage to the Jews over their several century rule over the Jews in Israel and elsewhere. Shimon Tzadik's student is a man by the name of Antigonos, man of Soko. In fact, like we started off last time with the Pirkei Avos, chapter of the fathers, where it talks about Moses to Joshua to the elders to the prophets, the men of the great assembly, it continues to Shimon Tzadik, to Antignos, man of Soko. Under his reign, a terrible development happened amongst the Jewish people. And the background is quite interesting. If you look at his teaching, his adage in the chapters of our fathers, he used to preach altruism. Don't be like servants who serve the master, who serve God with the intention of receiving reward. Rather, do it altruistically. Worship God without thinking about what are you going to gain out of it. And it was his students who founded the movements to reject oral Torah and reject rabbinic authority. They are known as the Sadducees and the Baitusim, Bothesians. And the Rambam tells us what happened. They used to hear this lecture from their teacher, and he would drill this point home. You have to worship God altruistically. Don't think about the reward. 
And these students, they weren't the sharpest students, and they misunderstood his message. His message was, don't focus on the reward. Don't do it for the reward. But they misinterpreted it as, we don't get reward. There is no reward or punishment. There's no hope for us. And therefore, why are we worshiping God? So these two students departed Torah. And they tried to gather a following and start a movement. One of them was called Tzadok, Zadok. And he became the father of the Tzadokim, the Sadducees. And one of them was called Baitus, and he became the father of the Baitusim, the Bothesians. So they start this movement, but it does not succeed in attracting a following. They're preaching Torah is not legit, and the nation, the masses, don't buy it. So they do what every startup does. They do a pivot. And they say, no, of course the Torah is true. Of course. It's the rabbis that have corrupted it. The Torah, the written Torah, the Mosaic Torah, that's legit. That's true. That's from Sinai. That's divine. It's the Sanhedrin that is illegitimate. And now, once they have rejected the oral Torah, they could reject, of course, all the rabbinic law, all the decrees, all the ordinances that the rabbis have done over the course of the centuries. But moreover, a written Torah demands an oral Torah. Because if you read the written Torah, there's a lot that is not explicitly addressed. So invariably, you're going to need an, an oral Torah. And now, once these Sadducees and Baitusim, once they invalidate the rabbinic tradition of the oral Torah, they say, okay, now we're going to invent our own. We have free reign to interpret the Torah at will. So remember, the, the purpose of the Sanhedrin, the purpose of oral Torah is twofold. To explain the original written Torah and to make new decrees and ordinances and now these two sects, the Sadducees and the Matusims, are going to reject all of that. And the Rambam, when he talks about this history, he says this opened up Pandora's box. From that point forward, there are many bad groups. And he says, in our land, this is the Rambam talking, of course the Rambam lived in Egypt, in our land, I'm referring to Egypt, you have the Karaites. The Karaites came much later, came a thousand years after the Sadducees, but it's almost identical. They are the continuation of the heresy that started with the students of Antigonus. And they began to reject the interpretation of the verses and the edicts, and they are the opposite of what God said, and quotes the verse in Deuteronomy. We have to listen to the Sanhedrin, and we cannot depart from them, not right and not left. So we have the straight line. We have the Hellenists, Sadducees, Baitusim, Karaites. And one may argue that a certain version of these groups still exists today. You have the people that reject Torah wholesale. You have the people that reject the system of the oral Torah, i.e. the accepted tradition of the meaning of the Torah since Moses and the binding nature of rabbinic law. That all started 2,300 years ago or so with the students of Antignos. So we can already see at the very beginning of the Second Temple era, we could see already the coming storm that's going to shake things up. After Antignos, Man of Socro, we have five Zugos. We have five pairs of sages. One of them is the president of the Sanhedrin. One is the head of the court of the Sanhedrin, so they're the two leaders of the Sanhedrin, and they're going to be at the helm of our leadership. It's not one person, it's not Shimon Atarik, Antignos, Man of Soko, it's two. And again, if you read the Mishnahs in Perky Avos and Chapters of, of Our Fathers, it goes in the straight line. The, the men of the assembly, Shimon Atzadik, Shimon the Righteous, Antignos, Man of Soko, and then the five pairs that led the nation. So we have these five Zugos, five pairs of Zugos. We have Yossi ben Yoezer, man of Treda, Yossi ben Yochanan, that's the first pair, 
Yehoshua ben Prachia Netai Arbeli. That's the second pair. Yehuda ben Tabai Shimon Machetach, the third pair. Shemaya and Avtalion, and finally Hillel and Shammai. They are going to be the standard bearers of Oral Torah. They're going to institute the decrees, and like the generations that preceded them, there are some notable ones that I want to talk about that are still relevant today. So, for example, over the course of the era of the Zudos, we have the Hanukkah story and the Hanukkah festival and mitzvos that was enacted by these Zudos. Moreover, mandatory schooling for all Jewish children, which sounds very modern. The idea that every child needs to go to school, that came from this time. Um, us, you know, 2,000 years before everyone else got it, we were already doing it. A prohibition, a new rabbinic decree against studying Greek philosophy. You would imagine when the rabbis saw the destructive nature of Jews being drawn to the Greek philosophy, they made an edict against it. A prohibition against raising pigs. The Greeks had a fascination with pigs. And we know in the Torah, the pigs almost embody impurity. And Antiochus, the primary antagonist of the Hanukkah story, he is someone who tries to institute swine sacrifice in the temple. So the rabbis say, okay, it's prohibited for any Jews to raise pigs. Hillel gave us the Prus Bowl. The Prus Bowl is a legal loophole to enable a person to extract payment from loans that were canceled during Shemitah. So we have this era of the Zugros, but when we study it more clearly, more carefully, we find that it too was fraught with unprecedented challenges to the normal course of Jewish and Torah life. So we have, of course, the Hanukkah story. There was a terrible king. His name was Antiochus, Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, he liked to go by. And he had a bunch of Jewish collaborators, the Hellenists, and they begin to attempt to systematically deconstruct the Jewish religion. They begin by interfering with the internal affairs of the Jewish life. They go to the temple and they depose the righteous high priest and they install a Hellenized high priest. And he begins to institute Greek idolatrous ritual into the temple. The Greeks likewise forbid any time-related Jewish practices. So, organizing a new moon, Shabbos, festivals, all those are banned. Torah study was forbidden. Torah scrolls were publicly burned. Of course, we have the legend of the Jews hiding their books and pulling out their dreidel when the authorities arrive. Antiochus attempts to have swine sacrifices instituted in a temple. Circumcision is prohibited on pain of death. If a woman has her child circumcised, both the mother and the child are going to be killed by the authorities. The laws of Nida, the laws of kosher, all banned. And the Greeks would do their public displays of nudity, and then you have the Hellenized Jews that decide to do circumcision reversal surgery. Obviously, these are not ideal conditions to maintain and perpetuate our religion. If you cannot teach Torah, if you cannot study Torah, how exactly do you expect Torah to be perpetuated in the way that it always was? So the Jews mount a rebellion. They have a war. And they win. What a miracle. And there's a new Jewish kingdom, the Hasmonean dynasty, but that, too, coincides with the rise of an internal threat, the organized heresy of the Sadducees. Now, it's important to stress, this is something which is often missed in, in Jewish history, the Hellenists are the Jews that want to follow the Greeks. The Sadducees are not really a different group. 
when you have the fall of the Greeks in Israel, their Jewish collaborators, the Hellenists, they still existed. But it fell out of fashion to be a Hellenist when the Greeks were public enemy number one. So they rebranded themselves, oh, we're not Hellenists, we're Sadducees. But the ultimate ideology actually remained the same. There is a myth that's often told of the Sadducees being super righteous. And it's the rabbis coming and corrupting it all. That's a myth, because in fact, in Jewish history, these are just the rebranded heretics that used to be called Hellenists, and now because the Greeks, or Hellenism is associated with the Greeks, were called now Sadducees. And, of course, they target the foundation of Torah, namely Oral Torah. Because if you don't have Oral Torah, you cannot have Torah at all. Now, there is an interesting custom that we still do today to counter the Sadducees and their heirs, the Karaites. And that's the consumption of the chalant or the chamin, the hot stew that is eaten in many Jewish communities on Shabbat morning. These groups ostensibly came to repudiate oral Torah. Now, we know that they came to repudiate Torah in general, and oral Torah is the way, the key, so to speak, to undo the keystone of Torah. You undo oral Torah, and Torah is gone. But because they rejected oral Torah, the idea of having a fire on Shabbat became anathema to them. Because the verse says, Lo You should not have a fire in your cities on Shabbat. Now we know, thanks to the Oral Torah, that this means do not kindle a fire on Shabbat. But it does not say to not have a fire on Shabbat. And therefore, there were certain Karaites that would sit in absolute darkness on Shabbat because you can't have a fire. Because they took the written Torah literally and therefore, there can't be any fire. So you can't have any hot food, and you can't have any illumination, because you can't have any fire. So what do we do? We show that we are embracing the uninterrupted rabbinic tradition of oral Torah, so we deliberately eat hot foods on Shabbat morning, provided, of course, that we don't cook it on Shabbat, and that the fire that was preserving the stew was made before Shabbat, and that is the origin of that ubiquitous custom. So we're looking at the Second Commonwealth, the Second Temple Era, and we see all kinds of threats to Jewish life, the way it always was done, creeping up. But there's more. During this period, there were terrible purges, wholesale assassinations of rabbis. So, for example, the Hasmonean dynasty gets off to a fabulous start. You have the Maccabean family. They spearhead their revolt against the Greeks. It starts off with great glory, but it ends in ignominy for a variety of reasons, but primarily because this family, this glorious Kohanic family, actually become Sadducees themselves, and therefore they become enemy of the people. You have a king. His name is Alexander Yanai. He's not content with being king, being the Hasmonean king, the Jewish king. He says, I'm going to be the high priest as well. Remember, the Maccabees, the family of the Hasmoneans, they are priests. They are Kohanim, which by Jewish standards makes their kingdom illegitimate because a king has to be from the descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. And if they're a Kohen, they're from the tribe of Levite. So they could be a Kohen, they can't be a king. Now, at the inception of this dynasty, they didn't call themselves kings. They call themselves princes. But once the next generation arrives, they're not princes, they're kings, and King Alexander Yanai says, I'm king, and I'm also going to be high priest. But because he's a traitor, he's a turncoat, he's a Sadducee, he comes into the temple 
and corrupts it all. And even the laws that were accepted universally amongst the Jewish people, but a part of oral Torah, that are not found in the written Torah, like the water libation that was done in Sukkot, he deliberately mocks the nation. Instead of pouring the water onto the altar, he pours it onto his own feet in front of the entire nation. And the nation gets enraged, and this is, of course, Sukkot, and they all take their esrogim, their Sichuan fruits, and start pelting it at him. And they almost kill him. And he perpetrates a massacre, and he kills thousands of people. But the Talmud, the book of Kedusha, page 66a, tells us that he actually had all the sages in the land slain, with the exception of one sage, Shimon ben Shetach, who was one of these Zugos that we talked about earlier. Why did he spear Shimon ben Shetach? Because Shimon ben Shetach was his brother-in-law. So what does he do? He takes the Sanhedrin, takes all the rabbis, kills them all, leaves one around. The rabbis who got wind of it, they flee. Rabbi Yeshua ben Parachia, one of the other Zugos, flees to Egypt with several of his students. And now, Alexander Yanai says, okay, I got control of the Sanhedrin. I am going to stack the court with a bunch of Sadducee friends of mine. And we're going to take this institution over from within. So you have one great sage, Shimon ben Shetach. He's the brother-in-law. He's protected by the king. And he's surrounded with a bunch of dolts, a bunch of Sadducee rabbis who are totally ignorant. And now he undertakes an effort to try to restore the integrity of the court. And whenever there was a halachic question presented before them, he would say, okay, well, where's the verse of this in the Torah? Y'all profess to be such experts in written Torah. It's the oral Torah that you don't like. Okay, well, let's deal with written Torah. And of course, they were ignorant in that as well. Now, Alexander Yanai, he's the king, he's the high priest. He says, I'm also part of the court. Why? Because in Gentile kingdoms, it was common to have the king preside over the court. Of course, in Judaism, it's a meritocracy. It's the greatest sages. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're a sage and you're worth it, you could come join. But Alexander Yanai is sitting on the court with one great sage. The rest of them are Sadducees. This is obviously a horrific corruption of the system as we know it. Some of the rabbis escape. Many of them are killed. And over time, things quiet down, and the great sage Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia actually returns from Egypt. And he rejoins the Sanhedrin, and slowly they manage to take it over. Every vacancy that happens is filled with a Torah sage. And slowly they're able to restore the system to the way it was, by nudging all these Sadducees out. But obviously, this gives us a window into the world during the Second Temple era to perpetuate Torah under conditions when the rabbis and the Sanhedrin are wantonly murdered. It's nearly impossible. And the Talmud even says that it nearly succeeded. The disruption of Torah was almost complete. It was only thanks to the wizardry of Shimon ben Shetach that the Jews kept the Torah and were prevented from forgetting it. But Alexander Yanai's assassination of the rabbis was not the only rabbinic purge. You have the Romans coming in, and they appoint a puppet by the name of King Herod, who's a despot, who's a tyrant, and he rules Judea at the pleasure of the Romans in the latter part of the first century before the Common Era. And he, too, savagely murders all the rabbis. And the Talmud actually gives us an account of this. This is found in Bava Basra, page 3b. 
it tells us that Herod was a slave to the house of the Hasmoneans. In fact, there's a whole discussion whether he was even halachically Jewish. He may have not been halachically Jewish. So Herod is a slave for the Hasmoneans when the Hasmonean dynasty is still standing, even though it's in its later years. And he sets his eyes upon a certain young girl from the house of the Hasmoneans. He has a crush on one of the Hasmonean princesses. And one day, he hears a divine voice that tells him any slave that rebels right now is going to succeed. So he rebels, and he kills all his masters, but he keeps the girl. And he says, I'm going to become the king here. I'm going to invite the Romans in, and I'm going to have my kingly credentials because I'm going to be married to the heiress of the Hasmoneans. But this girl doesn't want any part of Herod. She goes up on top of the roof, and she declares... Anyone who says that they are from the house of the, Has- of the Hasmoneans is actually a slave, since I am the last remnant of this once glorious family, and I'm about to go. She jumps off the roof, and she kills herself, and thenceforth, no one from the house of the Hasmoneans remains. A family that started off with such promise ended off really in, in a sad, in a sad and tragic manner. So Herod, this is again the Talmud's account of Herod's rise. Herod takes the squirrel's body and he preserves it in honey to prevent it from decaying and decomposing for seven years. According to some opinions, he engaged in necrophilia with it. According to others, he just kept it there to give the impression that he was still married to her. And that way people would say, well, you know what? He's not a king, but at least he's married to the descendant of royalty, to the descendant of the Hasmoneans, and therefore that gives him some legitimacy. But he was obviously obsessed with the idea that he's not being accepted by the people. They're saying, is he really Jewish? Is he really not Jewish? Does he have the legitimacy of being a king or not? And then he says, wait a minute. Who are the ones that say that only a Jew could be king of the Jews? It's the rabbis, after all. They're my true enemy. They're the ones who are sowing these doubts in my kingly credentials. I'm going to go after them. So he gets up and he kills all the rabbis with the exception of one, Bava ben Buta. That's the one rabbi that he preserves. And even this one rabbi that he preserves, he says, you know what? I'm not going to allow him to go unimpeded. I'm going to gouge out his eyes. So again, we see Torah on the rocks. All the rabbis were killed by Alexandriana, with the exception of one or two, and they were able to restore Torah. Herod, several decades later, is also killing all the rabbis. And once again, a great hero arises to reinvigorate the people, and that is Hillel, Hillel the Babylonian. And he is appointed as the Nasi, he is appointed as, as, as the head of the Sanhedrin. And the Talmud tells a very dramatic story of how he got that post, because remember, Herod kills all the rabbis. And if there's no rabbis, then even simple questions that most people would know when there are competent leadership, questions are unanswered. You have Pesach falling out on Saturday night. And of course, the day before Pesach, you do the Pesach sacrifice. But can you do the Pesach sacrifice on Shabbat? Does the pastoral offering override the Shabbat? That was the question that no one knew the answer to. Now we know that the reason why no one knew the answer to it is because all the rabbis were dead. And you have leadership that's desperate to find someone competent. So they make an announcement. Is there anyone who knows this law as to whether or not Pesach, the pastoral sacrifice, overrides the Shabbat? So they tell him, well, there is one rabbi that recently came from Babylon. He was not subject to the burges of 
Herod and Alexander Yanner because he wasn't here. He was in Babylon. And his name is Hillel. Why don't you ask Hillel? So they bring Hillel in and he says, yes, it does override the Shabbat. And he starts bombarding them with proofs. And people are like, oh my goodness, he reminds us of the sages we had in the past. What a great sage this Hillel person is. And the leaders of the nation, they're called the Bnei Becerra. They were the official heads of the nation. They abdicated their position. And they say, we're giving all the keys to the kingdom to you. You are someone who can restore the Sanhedrin to its previous glory. It's an amazing story here. Torah in Judea is under assault. The numbers of scholars has been depleted. And comes along Hillel, ascending with other scholars from Babylon, and they're going to replenish the depleted ranks of Torah leaders. The Talmud tells us, the book of Sukkah, page 20a, Torah was forgotten from the Jewish people, and Ezra came from Babylon and restored it. And Torah was subsequently forgotten by the, by the Jewish people, and Hillel came from Babylon and restored it. The Talmud tells us that this family, this B'nai B'Sera, they voluntarily resigned their position as the Nasi, as the president, in favor of Hillel. They are on the short list of people who forfeited their crowns in this world, but inherited a crown in Olam Abba. But again, we see that the history of the Jews at the time is not at all conducive for Torah continuity uninterrupted. And again, this is not going to be the only purge of rabbis, and these are not going to be the only challenges that the nation is going to face before oral Torah is indeed codified. There are all kinds of challenges forthcoming, including realities that were never seen since Sinai, and these factors are going to contribute to the most monumental project in Jewish history, the writing of the Mishnah, and the codification of oral Torah. My email address is rabbiwalbajim.com. I look forward to hearing any questions, any comments, any feedback of any kind. I deeply appreciate it.